Uh, so I thought Wednesday would be an appropriate uh, beginning to my talk. I like to start with everything 70s, 80s, 90s, because those were the good eras back when I didn't exist. Um, well, I guess it was the 90s. But OK. So for the last <laughs> year, I've worked as a front-end developer at Coursera. Uh, and uh, how many of you have taken a Coursera class or signed up for Coursera? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you have gotten one week in? Oh, am I supposed to be loud? OK. How many of you have gotten one week into a Coursera class? Uh-huh, and anyone actually completed a class? Wow, very nice. Scala class? Is that SAS? SAS, what else do you guys complete? Algorithms, all right, very nice. Uh, which one? Gamification. Okay, so there's a ton of classes, right? There's stuff like how to cook your baby. Um, <laughs> that's actually a very popular class. Um, there's one that started a few weeks ago on volcanic eruptions, and my mom was emailing me bugs for that, and I was like, oh, mom, you're so silly taking a class on volcanoes. That's what old people do. They take silly classes. And then I found out she's like working on a research paper for NASA on analyzing the the plums the plumes for volcanic eruptions using Fortran. So it, it turns out there's actually really valid reasons to take classes on volcanic eruptions. She also got 110% in heterogeneous parallel programming. So she's basically a more accomplished person than I am at this point in life. Um, but it's cool because she's mom, so I've got time to catch up. All right, so Coursera, right? So any of you who haven't uh, signed up for a class and not taken it, uh, Coursera offers online uh, university level classes from all these different universities and they're across a huge range of topics and you do stuff like watch lectures, take quizzes, do peer assessments, talk in the forums, all of that stuff. Um, and it is actually really, really cool when you, uh, when you take a class and get through it. Uh, I did the Irrational Behavior class with Dan Ariely, which I highly recommend. Um, Especially Dan, I like Dan. Um, so anyway, so Coursera, uh, we use Backbone a lot. Uh, basically in all of our new modern code bases, we use Backbone everywhere. And I've actually spent the last year writing a lot of blog posts and giving various talks on Backbone. Um, so if you're curious about how we use Backbone at Coursera, I've got links here. I, I put together this whole guide of writing how we write apps at Coursera, which is kind of our best practices in terms of models and views and regions and all that. I um, also did some deep dives on different things that we did, like rewriting Django Admin, rewriting our forums, and, and some stuff on performance. Um, so for the last year, I've been going to these conferences that are not called Backbone Conf, and I've been giving talks on Backbone. So for Backbone Conf, I'm not going to give a talk on Backbone at all. <laughs> uh, so this talk is not about Backbone. Um, because the thing is that at Coursera, we do have multiple code bases. As in, we have a legacy code base, and our legacy code base is that beautiful thing known as PHP. Um, and it's PHP with a custom written framework written by some grad students who, you know, they just really wanted to write their own and not document it. And uh, it's that beautiful thing where you mix together HTML, and you've got PHP outputting script tags with global variables in it. Um, so <laughs> we're not using Backbone there yet because it's taking time to port it over. But uh, we do use UI libraries there, right? Even in our old code base, we need to have modals, we need to have pop-ups, we need to have tooltips, we need all of that. And we want to have a consistent UI experience across all of Coursera, both for our users and for our developers, right? If you need a modal, you should be able to use the same modal library in the backbone code base as in the non-backbone code base, right? Um, so we, we kept running into the issue of realizing we would need a UI library and trying to figure out which UI library we should use and trying to use the same one across our code bases, right? Uh, how many of you have used UI libraries before? <laughs> okay, very nice. It should be everyone. Um, it's cool, you can do backbone on the server. Um, so we're gonna be talking about UI library design and I'm not talking about aesthetic design. <laughs> I tried to make that very obvious by making my slides highly unattractive. <laughs> I actually think they're really, really cute though. Um, but uh, we're not gonna be talking about aesthetic design, right? We're gonna be talking about the actual behind the, the scenes design, right? The, the actual layout of the code, the architecture of the libraries, right? Um, but if you really, really like these slides, you can totally copy them. It's, it's cool, discredit me. Um, so when we thought about which UI libraries to, you know, what we were going to use, 
we obviously started with jQuery plugins, right? Because it's like, hey, we're going to use UI library. There's thousands of jQuery plugins. So let's get started talking about that. Um, so I looked up and got a history of jQuery plugins because I was kind of curious, like, where did jQuery plugins come from, right? Because a lot of times we use stuff today and we don't know their history. And I always find it fascinating to find out the history of the things, right? If you've never, like, looked at screenshots of the first browser that they made, it's fascinating because they used to like every image would open up in its own page because they couldn't imagine you ever wanting to having images like in line in the page and they thought all your images would be epic and every every page had an edit button right because that's why HTTP has all these verbs because they imagined originally you would just be editing everybody else's web pages um, so anyway it's really fascinating to actually look at the history of the things we use today instead of just kind of assuming that they are what they are so jQuery was released in January 2006 and um, John uh, Resnick says that he actually built it from the beginning with the idea of plugins. So from the very first day, you could actually make plugins uh, with jQuery, right? And just 25 days later, the first jQuery plugin from a third-party developer came out, right? Uh, and then they started to see more and more people making plugins. And so they, they, on June 2007, they actually came up with the jQuery plugin repository to help people actually find these plugins, right? Um, and you guys have probably all, all seen that. Uh, and then they started working on jQuery UI because there were so many people that were doing these kind of UI things with jQuery. They're like, all right, well, we should try and get a common, common library that's built on top of jQuery that works well and has even a better architecture, right? Because jQuery plugins weren't much of an architecture. You were just doing the $.fn thing. Um, but jQuery UI widgets, they actually have much more of an architecture to them. Um, and so it can be a little more consistent when you're actually using that jQuery UI, right? And so in May 2009, they came up with this jQuery UI widget factory, which was a standard way of building widgets on top of jQuery U UI, right? So we accumulated jQuery plugins starting from, you know, the very first time, January 2006. So that was like, let's do math here. That was like seven years ago, right? That was ages ago. Um, and so we've been building up all these plugins since then, right? And jQuery plugins are actually really, really awesome, and we, we should be really thankful for them because they did a lot of good things for the developer community, right? So they, they generally, like, the, the approach of jQuery, like, from the very beginning was to encourage people to write plugins, right? And say, like, you know, if you actually want to build something on top of jQuery, do it in this plugin style. We've come up with this way for you to do that, right? So from learn.jQuery.com, the ba barrier to creating a plugin of your own is so low that you'll want to do it straight away. <laughs> Some might argue that maybe the barrier is too low, but you know, hey, it's, it's <laughs> nice to have low barriers. Um, that might be true about all of the web, but that's cool, it's good. Everybody, everybody in the world will be programming, and it'll be awesome. Um, there'll be a lot of bugs, but hey, we, we, it's not like none of us write bugs, right? It's, whatever, let other people like, everybody should have the right to write bugs in software. Even little babies. Um, okay, and then, you know, one of the big uh, things about jQuery was its accessibility, right? So it was like a message from jQuery that they wanted, you know, the jQuery community wanted you to create plugins and wanted you to build on top of jQuery. Uh, and that's cool. It encourages people to, you know, extend jQuery how they want. And it also gave a, a standard way to write UI libraries, right? It wasn't just put down a bunch of JavaScript. It was, hey, attach something to this $.fn, and then with jQuery UI Widget Factory, it was even more specific with, you know, whatever five different methods that you would define and all that stuff to say what happened when you initialize the widget. Um, and then there's all these blog posts that, and articles that people would write to actually talk about the architectures for jQuery plugins, right, to try and add even more to that. So it was basically like when you thought to yourself one day, like, hey, I want to write a UI library, you would probably think to write a jQuery plugin because that's kind of the standard. It's the only standard really that we think of right now, at least for me, that I think of when I think of I want to write a UI library, right? So in the beginning at Coursera, whenever we would think, oh, we want to write a UI library, we would look at the how to write a jQuery plugin doc and we'd start writing it that way. Um, and, you know, the jQuery community also encouraged sharing, right? So they've got the jQuery plugins repository, and there's even alternative repositories for people who don't like the jQuery plugins repository. You like it, like, more visual like this. But, you know, there's tons of these plugins. There's probably, like, three times as many <coughs> as you actually see in this repository, right? If you just Google for it. If you Google for jQuery date picker plugin, 
the first 10 results will be all blog posts that are meta, that are like top 10 jQuery date picker plugins, right? <laughs> you know, we like love this. We're like, wow, top 10. Damn, it's better than Google. Um, it's not really. Um, here's a tip. Whenever you're searching for any sort of library, go to, oh, let me like demonstrate, right? Um, so if we go to Google, like, and let's say we want a date picker JS library, right? Go to, sorry, go to search tools. Go to any time and do past year or past month, right? Um, and what you'll tend to find, I usually do this to try and get an idea for things that are more recent, especially if I'm doing something really, re like let's say you're doing like freaking, okay, HTML5 video pro. Right? Uh, like I was looking for a bug, but like MP4 multiple play. Um, so this one, I will always limit this, pretty much always limit this to the past year, even past month, right? Because when we're using this kind of, you know, really crazy new stuff, uh, you know, if, and if you're trying to target mobile, a lot of the solutions wouldn't have come out until the last year, right? And if you're looking at a bug that you suspect is in like the most recent version of Chrome, it's only useful to look at the last month. Um, so, you know, just a little Google tip for you. I did work for Google before, and it was mostly because I'm really good at Googling. Like, I, even like my Google colleagues would like send me search terms, they're like, hey, I really want to find this, could you Google it for me? <laughs> I'm like, all right, you know, we're all Googlers here, but it's cool, I'll find it for you, no problem. Just give me a, give me a little bonus, you know? All right. So jQuery plugins were awesome because they encouraged this whole uh, community of, of these open source libraries and that everyone could share and learn from and use for their stuff, right? Because I am a big fan of not reinventing wheels um, because I kind of think that developers, we should just all be working on adding our own unique value to the world. I think is like whenever I'm writing a bit of code, I just have this like deep urge to open source it because I think to myself, what if there's somebody out there in the world who needs to write this code tomorrow? I should make sure they can find it, right? I don't know if you guys get that urge too, but like, I, it's, it's really, ugh. So I just think I have to like accidentally gist it or whatever and not tell anyone. Um, <laughs> gisting is a great way of not open sourcing. Um, so anyway, so jQuery plugins um, were great. But they're, they're not actually perfect, right? So one of the big deals about them is they do depend on jQuery, right? So you have to have jQuery in order to run them and you may not always want to use jQuery. Now you might argue that, oh, you could just throw in something that's jQuery compatible, like Zepto. I would then tell you that I spent a, a year where I, I did actually, uh, I was making a mobile phone gap app and I wanted to improve the performance, so I switched out jQuery for Zepto. I then discovered that jQuery plugins use the most obscure features of jQuery possible, right? None of which were supported by Zepto, right? So I would be sitting there, like I, I spent weeks staring at the jQuery source viewer, copying like its, its code into the Zepto code, yeah. and building up my Zepto, uh, my Zepto library so that it had all this functionality. And then I was all ready to, to give it back to Zepto. And then the Zepto author decided that semicolons weren't cool. So he stripped semicolons out of Zepto. And then it came really hard to diff my <laughs> library with his. So if you're going to decide that semicolons aren't cool, do it at the inception of your library, not in the middle. Um, anyway, so, right. So the thing is, like, <laughs> it's not just that you're dependent on the jQuery selectors jQuery plugins use the craziest, most obscure things in, in jQuery, right? Um, so they pretty much are dependent on jQuery um, and its, it's, it's subtleties. Um, and a lot of them are also dependent on jQuery UI, right, if they're built on top of the jQuery UI. So that means you need the jQuery UI JavaScript as well. You also need the jQuery UI CSS. I spent like a good week trying to take out jQuery UI from our code base as much as we could because we already had lots of other CSS and JS and it's like, well, this doesn't seem necessary. Why do we need it? And then I discovered that we we're using it for the jQuery UI date picker, which is pretty much the only date picker that does dates and times and time zones all in one. So we had to keep it. Um, and since it was built on top of those, we couldn't really strip those out. 
Um, so there's that issue, right? But there's also the issue of their internal architecture, right? So a lot of these plugins were built before there were best practices about how to structure plugins. Um, I think a lot of that stuff has been recent, right? Because, you know, say we've had plugins for the last seven years. So sometimes their architecture is inconsistent with other architectures and sometimes they just they don't really have architecture <laughs> it's kind of a bunch of code um and look the thing is you know what you're pretty much always going to i pretty much find every time i use a third-party library i end up digging into it right they're they're all they're pretty much never a black box there's always some little weird thing so i always recommend before you start using a library look at its code first if you puke a little bit in your mouth, you should probably <laughs> find a new library because you will probably have to look at that code later. You'll probably have to set breakpoints in it. Uh, you'll probably, you know, have to actually maybe modify it, send a patch back, right? So, you know, it, it should be, like, I don't want to offend people. I'm sure I've written code that would also make you puke in your mouth, right? Um, so it's just when you're, when you're picking something that you're in, gonna invest time in, you know, make sure you're going to be happy investing your time in it. It's going to make you joyful, right? Like, if you look in the code and you see a ternary operator that's nested 12 levels deep, <laughs> uh, and this is in a, I can tell you exactly which libraries have these, um, just walk away. Because uh, entangling those, I've once had, I had to, uh, uh, like, disentangle one of those ones. And it, it took me like an hour to disentangle it so that I could put in the correct, uh, you know, console.logs and all that stuff, right? Because or, and using, I think it was alert, because I was debugging on mobile, and ugh, anyway. So, okay, right, so at Coursera, like we started off with jQuery plugins, but then we're like, eh, we don't really want to have this dependent on jQuery, and we also just kind of want to see, you know, what kind of architecture would we come up with for our UI libraries if we kind of threw away this jQuery plugin thing, and we started from scratch. Um, so that's what we did. And, uh, you know, we kind of try to think, like, what are the different things we would want in a library, right? So some of the things, like, obviously with jQuery plugins, one of the great things is how easy they are to customize, and there is a consistent way that people do that. Um, but we also didn't want them to be dependent on jQuery. We wanted them to be compatible in AMD and non-AMD environments, because our backbone code is AMD, our other code is not. Uh, we also wanted it to be usable by both developers and designers. We wanted it to be really easy for our designers to be able to modify these libraries. Um, and there's actually quite a few other things that we wanted. So we'll step through that. So as our example, we are going to be making a marquee library. Because uh, I love marquee. Uh, little known fact, the marquee tag works perfectly fine in Chrome. Right? You can actually, like we could go and turn this into a marquee <coughs> right now, right? Let's just do a little inspect element action. All right. And marquee. So, Marquee works fine in Chrome, Flink works fine in Firefox, but not the vice versa, right? So basically, they, they each of them kept their own thing, um, but you can't have Blink and Marquee on the same browser, so you're going to have to pick one. I do have a Chrome extension that will make Blink work for you on Chrome. If that's of interest, you can talk to me after. I took it away from my, my <laughs> dashboard because... Um, it wasn't getting the as many stars as other things, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I you know I do have the code. So all right, so we're gonna make a marquee module, and we're not gonna do this as a polypool. We'll just do it as a library. So for the basic library, this is what we want. All right, so we want to be able to create a div. Um, it has some text in it, and uh, and then to use it, we just want to be able to see like okay, var marquee equals new marquee. Document get element by id marquee. And then uh, here I just put a little marquee.stop and a set timeout um, because I, I didn't want to give you guys epilepsy. Um, so it's going to stop after five seconds, right? <laughs> I say that after showing optical illusions for you to you for like 10 minutes, right? Um, so here's our HTML and our marquee. You can see it works beautifully. I did consult the CSS marquee set spec when making it. Not really. Um, so here's our JavaScript, right? So this is a pretty standard JavaScript class, right? We have a var marquee, a constructor function. It sets some initial position and the direction to forwards. And then we set interval for the timer. And the timer calls the move it, move it function. 
Anyone want to sing that? Uh, and uh, and the move it, move it function, we figure out the current left, we check if it's less than the window, we set the direction to backward or forwards, and then uh, you know we increment it plus or minus 10. All right, and then for our stop, we just clear the interval. So that's our basic library, um, and we're gonna build off of this. So the first thing we want to do is that we want to hide private functionality, right? This is that thing they call encapsulation in OOP. I think encapsulation is a really weird word, and every time I hear it, I forget what it means. Uh, so it's like the kind of thing, like before interviews, I have to look up all these fancy OOP words. Um, but uh, we can also call it information hiding. So basically, we want to hide private functionality, and the, the reason to hide private functionality is so that developers don't call it, right? If you don't, if you, you know, it's not, you want to have a stable interface, right? So you want to only expose the functions that you intend your developers to call. Now granted, these developers, they're just developers inside our company, so you might think like, well, I don't have to worry about them, they're only gonna call what I tell them to call. Like, no, they're gonna call anything you let them call. That's what we do in JavaScript. We're like, oh, I just, I found a method on your class, I kind of called it. Um, <laughs> So the only way we can prevent them <laughs> from calling it is if we hide it. We make it impossible, right? Like, well, you know, it's the thing is, like, I, when I worked at Google, I was working on the Google Maps API. Developers called every possible thing they could find. They dug inside those variables so deep. So I'm very familiar with those sneaky developers. Um, so okay, so what we can do here is that um, we're going to wrap everything um, in that that special word that means anonymous function. What's that word people use? Iffy. 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 It's an iffy. Okay, so I wrapped it in an iffy. <laughs> anyway, and then um, I created this uh, marquee module, and the marquee module has uh, private, underscore private, which is an object which has all the private functions we want, and um, then we have this marquee class inside here, which uh, we'll actually call private.moveitmoveit.callself, right? So the general thing is we put it inside this private object, and then when we want to call it from the, you know, the proper class, we're just going to use the dot .call, and we're going to pass in the context of that class, right? Um, and then from this marquee module, we only return marquee, right? And then window.marquee equals this module. So that means that they're never going, there is no way they can access underscore private because it is a local variable that is not returned um, to the marquee, the global marquee object. All right, so we've succeeded in making it so that they can't call that function, that's cool. So anytime going forward that we have anything where we think we want it to be private, we'll put it inside there. And generally, I would try and start with, whenever you're, you know, you're making an interface, you try and hide as many things as possible at first, and you only make things public when people really, really want them, right? Because you're gonna have to support those forever and ever. This doesn't matter as much for your internal libraries, but certainly when you're doing APIs, we always hide as much as possible and don't expose things until the developers are like crawling at your door begging for it. Which is great when that happens. Um, I used to get developers to like send me such great little just like swag boxes like, hey, maybe you sent me something nice from Russia, I could expose that method, you know? Um, <laughs> all right, uh, another thing we'd like to be able to do is like we'd like to be able to call marquee on the same DOM object twice and not have it actually reinitialize the marquee on that object, right? Because I get kind of forgetful, I forget that I already called marquee on that, 40 lines later, I call it again, oops. Um, and in the previous code, like if I did this in where, all right, so let's try this in the, in the code we have open right now and see what happens. Mm -mm -mm. All right, so did it work? So you notice how it didn't stop? It didn't stop because I actually, I accidentally set up two sets intervals here because I accidentally constructed it twice. Um, so we don't want that. We want there to only be one marquee object tied to that bit of DOM. So what we'll do is just, we'll just remember that in the, uh, in the DOM. So I've added this get or make marquee function to private. 
And what that does is it looks to find if there's a marquee object on the element now. And if there is, and if the constructor matches the public marquee constructor, then we just return that object. Otherwise, we do construct a new one. And we set the marquee object on the element to that object, and then we return it. Uh, so then down here, instead of just returning marquee, we're going to create this public function, which will take the element and returns the private getter make marquee function, <coughs> right? So anytime they call marquee, it's actually going to that getter make marquee function instead. So we made things a little bit safer, right? Like you should just make it so it's hard for developers to make stupid mistakes because we're kind of easy, at, you know, it's kind of easy for us to do that, right? Because, you know, probably half of you are hacking on your code base right now, kind of half paying attention to this, half paying attention to your code base. It's really easy for you to actually call a function twice there, right? Because you're not really paying attention to anything in life. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we keep going, right? So we want to be able to customize uh, our library, right? Um, I gotta let you, you guys are probably thinking that a lot of jQuery plugins you know, do all this already, which is true, but I think it's actually interesting to step through and see how we, we actually would do this um, from scratch. And we'll add more stuff. So we wanna be able to customize the library, so we wanna be able to pass in an object literal of options, right? So that's pretty straightforward to do. I'm just gonna add another private function, which is uh, customize marquee. It'll take in the options, and it'll set the options and also set this, uh, this direction property according to the options. And then I need to modify get or make marquee um, because what I want to happen is that if you reconstruct marquee on an element that already has a marquee but with a new set of options, I actually want to take those new options, right? So you can, you can reconstruct twice and it won't really reconstruct but it will reset options. And that's the way that we tend to like our UI libraries to work but it's, a, it's something that you could think about, right? So if we do find that there's options passed in and we did find an existing marquee, then we'll just call the customize function but still return the same marquee. Otherwise, we pass them into the constructor and that will call it. So that's pretty cool. But the thing is, whenever you have options, you want to know what your options are, right? <laughs> you don't want to be like scrolling through the code, trying to figure out all the possible options for your options. Um, and you also want to know what the defaults are, right? So we're going to add some defaults. Um, and we're just going to do this similar to you know, how jQuery plug would do it. So in our private, we've got our defaults. And you can see it for each of the options, I list the default value. And then in the comments, I say what the other values could be. Um, and there I say you know, it could be any integer. And then in the customize marquee function, I first go through and check to see uh, you know, what all the options are and all the defaults. And if we haven't actually had something set in via the options, then I set it equal to defaults. Okay? Um, now, this gets more interesting, right? I was saying in the beginning that one of the things that's nice is if you can have it so your designers can also customize, uh, you know, your plugins, right? So, uh, I remember <coughs> when our designers first started, or at least when one of them first started, he was very used to doing everything via delivering Photoshop files. So the first day he delivered a Photoshop file to me. And I was like, mm, what are your feelings on HTML and CSS? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'd love to learn that. Nobody ever wanted me to before. Everywhere else he'd worked actually explicitly only wanted him to give them Photoshop files. Because for some reason they enjoyed the process of turning Photoshop into CSS. <laughs> I don't know. And I was like, no. No, go, go for it, go learn it, take some time. Also learn Git and GitHub. Um, <laughs> and, and he did, right? Like for a while, you know, with Git, it was kind of blindly copying and pasting commands and hoping not to delete the whole code base. That's um, <laughs> why you have a live branch and you don't tell them about it. So, uh, so the thing, so now our, now our designers are at the point where they know HTML and CSS. Um, one of them even knows Backbone too. But assuming that your designers can learn HTML and CSS, um, which is really useful because that's really, you know, it's what they're actually, it's the medium they're crafting in. So once they're able to do that, like once our designer knew HTML and CSS, he like he felt so powerful and he felt like he was, he was actually able to make much better designs, like he was speaking the same language as the final output. Um, so then you want to, you know, make it possible for them to edit things about the UI just in the HTML and not have to go into the JavaScript. Because it can be a little intimidating to dive into a backbone view and try and 
you know, find these things, uh, especially if you're not, you know, super <coughs> familiar with JavaScript. So we want to make it so we can specify options via data attributes, right? And so they could just tweak data attributes in order to play around with these options. And hey, developers like this too, actually. Most of the time we end up using declarative customization instead of a uh, script. So what we have, so in the HTML we've got those data attributes. And then in the JavaScript, we have this code here. We've just changed customize our keys so that it checks to see if there's actually a default um, on the element itself. Um, and we still have it, so because now you have to decide what's more important, the data attributes or the objects, the, the, you know, the JavaScript object you pass in. Um, so we consider the JavaScript object to still be able to override the data attributes, but you could make that decision yourself as to which should have precedence. So that's pretty cool. But we also want to make it so that designers don't even have to construct the library in JavaScript, right? Because we still have that marquee constructor. So ideally, they could just be art, like editing any bit of code and just say, oh, this is something that I want to be a marquee. And they could just throw something in there, right? So we can just add in a data attribute, data marquee, to say, hey, this is something that should be turned into a marquee. So to do that, we'll look at, um, we change public.start, or we actually we add public.start. So public.start is a static function, which will check to see if it's already actually if it's already really been you know called and initialized on this element so we pass in an element which is the element that we're going to search for marquees in and then we're going to search for everything with data marquee if we find anything with it we'll call the public function on it which will do the whole get or make marquee and then when this library is included we will call public.start on the whole body so when this library is first included it will process and look for any marquees in there now if you're doing backbone code you're probably loading your code, you, you probably actually have it that your HTML <coughs> exists after you've loaded this file. So in many cases, we'll actually explicitly call uh, marquee.start inside the view or you know, maybe farther up in the, in the like a router layer or something like that. Um, and you can just pass in the element for the view or you could pass in the whole body then again. So we don't really have to worry because we have this protective constructor. So that's cool. Uh, now, of course, we also want events, right? Events are a really nice way of finding out when things change, and we obviously want an event to find out when the marquee reverses, because that's incredibly important in life. So in order to do that, <laughs> we're going to set up a little event target on it. Um, so you notice right now I'm doing everything in what they call vanilla JavaScript. Um, <laughs> So I had to actually see how to do this in vanilla JavaScript, and Zakis has a really good post on it. So we create this uh, event target object, and it's uh, responsible for you know basically making it possible to add listeners to our object and to fire, and uh, you know call back those listeners. So once we add that, um, we can make our marquee extend that, and then in our code when the reverse actually happens inside here, we'll just say this dot fire reverse. And that means that in our outside code, we can listen to that event, right? Now, one thing actually I realized would be a better thing to do that we haven't done is we don't really have good documentation of this event, right? So if you wanted to see which events this library triggered, you'd have to go through the code and search for fire. This, I just realized this now, but we really should have some sort of thing at the top of the library. Ideally, you can get all the information about a library at the very top of the library, right? The readme, the defaults, all that. So. I think it'd be a good thing to try and figure out how to document all the events fired by a library at the very top, similar to how you <coughs> might do for your backbone views. All right, we want it to be AMD compatible, but not required, all right? Um, so we end up wrapping a lot of our the code we use in, these, in this thing that makes it work in either environment. So at the very bottom, we'll have this thing that checks to see if define is defined, um, and if define.amd is defined, and if so, we just you know do this little define block and we return the module. Otherwise, we just set window.marquee equal to the marquee module. So this way, we can use it in our backbone code and not worry about cluttering up the global namespace. And then we can use it in our nasty, gross PHP code, and we'll keep cluttering up the global namespace. But that's cool around there. <laughs> uh, yeah, for a good time, just. Look at the window object in that code base. It's awesome. 
Um, now, so, so far I was saying, I was doing everything with vanilla JavaScript. If you're probably looking at some of those things going like, eh, you could probably do that better if you brought in a library, and your code's not gonna really work in any other browser than this specific Chrome you're in right now. That's all true. So it's not that we actually do, <laughs> We don't actually write our libraries without, you know, li uh, our libraries without other libraries. Um, we very often, pretty much all of our libraries actually do bring in jQuery, right? But we wanted to have the option to not bring it in, right? Uh, which may seem kind of silly, but you know. Um, and when we do bring in jQuery, it's mostly just for DOM and also the, the data function, right? So here I'll show where we can actually bring in jQuery to marquee. So I can have a cross-browser marquee, it's really important. So we'll include jQuery on the page, and at the top, with the marquee module, we pass in the dollar, dollar, <laughs> and then we can use the dollar, right? So I changed my, uh, my lm.marquee object, so now I'm using the data function, that's kind of a nicer approach to storing the object on the, on the element. And you know, we're also using it for stuff like window width and CSS, um, and at the very bottom, I changed my define block to actually say, hey, we're relying on jQuery. Um, and uh, so here we'll just you know, use jQuery, bring it as a dollar, and return it with a dollar. Otherwise, if we're in that whole global space, then we just pass in window.dollar, right? So we're still compatible in AMD and non-AMD environments, and we can bring in these dependencies. <coughs> uh, another great library that we use a lot is Lucid.js, which is a lightweight um, way to do event triggering. Uh, so we'll often bring in Lucid, and what the way to use Lucid is you just, let's see, you say this.emitter equals lucidjs.emitter, and then what you can do is do this.emitter.trigger. Um, so that's pretty cool because you actually don't have to extend Lucid.js, you can just kind of mix, you know, just have an emitter as part of your object. Um, and you'll still get the exact same API as I had before, the dot on function. And once again here, we just say we've got two dependencies and we pass in the lucid.js or the window.lucid.js. So that's an example of um, you know, where we might bring in two dependencies. So I bring it in once it makes sense, right? Like I probably would have brought jQuery in at the beginning because you know, it's kind of easier to do stuff with the DOM with it. Um, and then lucid.js once I realized the event emitting. Another library we use often is Q and there's obviously like a whole talk the, about Q. So Q is great for promises. I did a scientific survey of my Twitter audience to find out what's the best library for promises. They all agreed it's Q. So it's been proven, you should use Q. Um, we also very often use underscore, which is kind of an obvious one to use when you're in the backbone stack, because it's like, uh, you have an underscore anyway, you might as well use it, right? So we use it for you know the uh, data manipulation. We, we often use it for extend, for mixing together our options with our data attribute options, with the past in options with the defaults, uh, often used for debouncing, um, but we'll just bring them in as we need them, right? All right, now, we definitely want our library to be testable, um, and this is something that gets me kind of sad a lot of times when I'm using a jQuery plugin, is that there are no tests, <laughs> um, especially when they announce that there's a new version of the plugin, but there's still no tests. I'm like, oh, okay, so can you just tell me what you plan on breaking? Or is this gonna be like one of those cool scavenger hunts? Um, so I, we really should be testing UI libraries, and I think we should be testing them even more than we test our normal code, because we're gonna be using the UI libraries across multiple parts of the site, right? And they're going, they're much more often, they're much more likely to be abused, right? Because you'll, you'll end up having somebody who's never been in your part of the code base but suddenly discovers like, oh, hey, there's this cool little library, I'm gonna use it. And then they, you know, they kind of use it in a different way than you expected, right? So most of the times when people, when we have bugs, they're not really bugs, they're just people using things in ways you didn't expect, right? Um, so this is true for users using our, our site, but it's also true for developers using libraries, right? Is that they're just using them in ways you didn't expect. And so you can try and write tests for them, and then when somebody does use your code in a way you didn't expect, that's fine, you just introduce another test that makes sure it works, right? You're not, it's, nothing's gonna you know, work 100% from the beginning, but when you start off with tests, it's really easy to add more tests to check for those more obscure uses that you never thought of, right? Um, so we typically use Mocha, JSDOM, Kai, and Sinon for our tests. Um, so I uh, wrote some tests using that. 
Uh, as you see, I'm on a Chrome Pixel, so I had to do this whole slide deck just using everything in browser, but JSPIN is cool, so yay. All right, so we have our HTML where we include Mocha and Kai and Sign-On. Even though I didn't use it, I just wanted to use Sign-On because so many people mentioned it yesterday that I was like, ah, oh, I want to mention it too. You should use it. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> I mean, I include the script tag, that's good, right? So here I'm using Mocha, and this is using the Mocha browser runner. Typically, I don't use the browser running. Typically, I use the, uh, let me show you, because I was really actually kind of upset that uh, uh, <coughs> Trevor didn't show the awesome reporter, right? So Mocha has all these reporters. So there's like the boring one, which he showed. Um, the, the one that everybody loves is the Yon Cat reporter, right? That's the best, right? You're, you know, how do you make your codes awesome? You just have a rainbow cat. Um, anyway, so you should use that one. But here we've got the browser reporter. And you can see I've got seven tests. Um, so we can look at the bottom and check out these tests, right? So we're using the BDD style. Um, I describe my set of tests marquee. I've got this mark, this before each that makes a div um, and sets the HTML to scroll me baby one more time. Um, and then we have some tests here. So we check that it sets the defaults correctly. Uh, it checks that it takes in options correctly. Um, it checks that it resets the options when we reconstruct it with new options, which is kind of a you know kind of a niche thing that we we um, wanted to happen. Uh, we check that it works to be declarative, right? So here I modify the original div I created and actually put the data attributes on it, and then test that the options come out as expected. Um, and I finally check the reverse event. So maybe the reverse event is probably the most interesting because I'm using the asynchronous uh, nature for the Mocha test. So you just pass in this done, uh, and it's, this is a f uh, function callback. And so once you actually get the reverse function, then I call done, right? And so if this was never called, you get this error from Mocha that said, uh, time out of 2,000 seconds exceeded, right? So that'll, that's what will happen with async tests if you have this done callback. But it's pretty neat how easy it is to do something like test for an event, right? Um, so it's cool. We've tested a lot of the code. Now, I haven't run any JS coverage tool or anything to see how much we've tested. But I do know there are some things I haven't tested. Because one thing that is very hard to test is the private functionality. Because remember how I hit all that functionality? Well, now I can't, I can't test it, right? Because all I can test is the results of it. I can't test um, like it itself, right? Because if this wasn't private, um, like if customized marquee wasn't private, I would probably use sign on to stub it out, and then I would check to make sure it was called once, right, in, in some particular test, right? So uh, we can't do that since we have no access to it from the test framework. So this is something that we kind of struggled with. Like now that we did this fancy thing of hiding functionality, how do you test it? Um, and I've seen a few different blog posts about it. I linked to one here. Um, I can't. I, I don't remember how we decided to do it ourselves, because most of the time we just try and avoid having to test that private functionality. But there are certain times when you'd want to. Um, so I think in, in this blog post, the guy actually recommends having a build process which strips, the, which makes it private, so that in your testing environment, they're not actually private, but in your live environment, they are. That's kind of interesting. Other approaches that, is that you could just have, I could put marquee dot underscore private <laughs> and assume that if you used that, you knew you were using private functionality. But that's, that's kind of, you know, you guys crazy developers, you, you're just going to use it anyway. Like private, I don't know what you're talking about. Is that a word? Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that's something to explore. We also want to document our libraries, all right? Um, I was kind of upset when I realized uh, at the end of this year that I'd written so much code at Coursera and basically documented none of it. And I was like, so I basically, I went on this documentation spree where all of my P PRs were simply documentations um, for things. But there's great, because they get instantly uh, approved. You, you don't even have to go through a process. People are like, yay, documentation. All right, so for libraries, the way to document it is just, you know, put something at the top. So I'll very often start off with why does the library exist? Because I think that's a very valid question, right? Like, why aren't we just using the marquee tag? Why did we find the need to make an entire library for the marquee tag, right? In this case, it's because, you know, the designers are constantly making us do marquees, and we just figure out, oh, we'll just make a library of it, right? Um, and I might also mention, like, future work 
for the library, right? Like emulating Blink. Um, so, and then you have the how to use this library. So that's the what you really need to have is how to use. And you might think it's really, really obvious because we all think our code is really, really obvious, or we think that oh, you should just read the code. You're so lazy. Whatever, right? Like we have better things to do. You know how to use the library. Just write it in there, right? That's all you have to do. If you're using a library that doesn't have documentation and you've now used it successfully, just document it because clearly you at least know one usage of it that works, right? Um, so you like you'll show the basic example. You might show the declarative example. You might show some some things about options, right? Um, and then every time I use a library and I didn't find out what I wanted in the <coughs> README, I'll just add it add it to it, right? And the bonus is like if one day you decided like open source it and make it all legit and shit, you'd already have your documentation. <laughs> Legit and shit, it's time for word. All right, so uh, the marquee library is something that I only just made up for uh, this talk. Um, but uh, I'll show some real world examples here. Although, am I actually, am I supposed to be done now? Because my time says 11.30, but I don't know what time that is here. Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> so uh, here's the readme library. The readme library is something that pops up this little banner at the top of the page. Um, which is pretty cool and you can say like so it's like for announcing things right we want to just give you this little announcement so you can say how long it should be up how many times they should have to click it before it reshows so we use it a lot to show to tell admins about new functionality we also use it to tell students about new functionality um, and we, we kept finding ourselves doing this over and over all over the code base so we just made a library for it right um, so cool things is that if you just specify data readme close on anything inside the readme, it'll prompt the readme to close. So you can add a close icon, you can have a link that closes it. So a lot of times in our libraries, we'll kind of have these data attributes that you can add in things inside the DOM, and they'll trigger something inside the library, right? And to reconstruct it, we can just pass in the, that DOM. So you can actually browse the code. I just did a snapshot of it, right? It's not like a fancy real open source library, but there's a little snapshot. So you can browse through and see it. Um, it's very similar to Marquee. Modals, I'm sure many of us have written like boxes <laughs> at some time in our life. So we, of course, have our modals. So with our modals, we'll, um, we'll have our div, which has the modal on it. And we also, we often use the bootstrap classes inside of it, but it's not required, right? So that's one of the things is that we often have the CSS optional, so that if you do want to bring in the bootstrap classes and have your modal look all bootstrap, you can. But then there's some places we don't. Like the main Coursera lecture viewer doesn't use the bootstrap classes, looks completely different, but it still uses this modal class because there's so much stuff about it that has nothing to do with what it looks inside, right? It has to do with how you get positioned on the page. Um, and then we have ways that we can get links on the page to actually open up, right? So you can have anchors for modals as well. Um, and this code maybe is a little more interesting because it, it enforces the singleton, right? So a lot of times you have these libraries, you only want one of them to exist. Uh, so I think the fancy name for that is singleton. So we have this code that will actually check and make sure that there's only ever one modal that's open and we'll go and close previous modals, right? So sometimes you'll need those <coughs> libraries. This is kind of awkward to have two modals, even if you're designing your tasks. Um, so we also have pop-ups, which are maybe like kind of big tool divs or drop downs, whatever you want to call them. Um, kind of like the bootstrap popovers. So one thing that's interesting in this is that you'll notice there's a lot of HTML this is because this is the amount of HTML you need to make a pop-up class accessible, right? So one of the things that Coursera has to do, it has to be accessible. I would get accessibility audits like every three months with a list of everything that was inaccessible about our website, which was always really, really fascinating. And a lot of them would have to do with libraries, right? Some of them were libraries we didn't control because there's a lot of libraries out there that are not accessible. Like if any of you have used Select2, it's great, not accessible at all. Um, if you've used any of the Bootstrap plugins, generally they're not accessible. So one of the things that we end up building into a lot of our libraries is accessibility. And if we can't build it into the library itself, we usually document in the readme and say, listen, this is what HTML you need to add in order to make sure that you're using this library in an accessible way, right? And for doing something that pops open something, you have to have all this ARIA stuff to say it's a button um, and also to say that it expands something else on the page. Um, so accessibility is something that's pretty important to us. And Ideally, you could work it into a library, but if you can't, just document how, right? And so we've got tons of other libraries too, and you know, you can imagine all the different ones we've had. 
Um, so you've seen there's lots of principles here, and the general idea behind them is just to make it better for developers to use. You want, when a developer is using your library, you want them to be happy. You don't want them to hate you, right? They're like, ah, oh, this person didn't document, and I keep messing it up, and it's really hard to use. And then they're just going to be glaring at you from like, you know, across the cubicle, and you'll just kind of run away and cry in the bathroom, which is what I do a lot. Um, <laughs> but you might look at all this and think like, oh, couldn't I just do all this with, with jQuery plugins? Uh, yeah, 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 you totally could, right? You could do all that and bag chips. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and you, you should, right? Like, these are all just principles that kind of things we discovered while trying to come up with these UI libraries from scratch. But these are just things to think about, you know, when you're evaluating a jQuery plugin, if you're writing your own, if you're writing a UI library without using jQuery plugins, I think these are just things that we encountered that you should think about in those situations. Um, so, you know, see where you can apply them. Uh, or if you don't like them, don't apply them, that's cool. Just, you know, t share next year what, what you've learned about doing UI libraries. Um, and that's the thing, right? I think the point of a lot of things today is we're just sharing things that we discovered, ideas we've had about nice ways of doing things. And it's really good to expose yourself to all these different ways of doing things, but it doesn't mean you should run home and go do everything in your code, right? It means that you now have this idea of all the possible different ways of doing things, and uh, you can kind of evaluate them and keep them back in your head and figure out what works best for you, right? Or invent something completely new. All right, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Hey, uh, just a question about the um, all the data attributes, and um, so I'm assuming that you have the potential there of having a lot of them on the page and having multiple libraries looking for their own selectors. Um, have you guys thought about that at all? Uh, yeah, just in terms of what you mean, like overlap between the data attributes, right? You, if you accidentally use the same data attributes across two different libraries, or just the efficiency, more just the efficiency of uh, doing data selectors. Oh, okay, right, right. So every time I talk about using data selectors, somebody points out that they're not very efficient for doing stuff, right? Which is true. You can look at a JS perf and selecting via via data selector is uh, not as performant as selecting via class or ID. But I feel like the performance difference is negligible, at least in terms of, I think our performance concerns are at a much different level than at that level, right? Because when you look at JSPerf, it's like, because uh, I have a, there's a post on that as well. It's like, oh, you can do 30,000 of these versus 10,000 of these in, you know, how many milliseconds? So I think that the performance, my, m my perception is that our performance issues are, are at a different level. And so I would rather have the developer productivity gains of data attributes um, then uh, and have that performance hit, which I suspect is uh, negligible for us. If you're doing mobile or something like, yeah, you could definitely consider that.